mechanical aspects, structural aspects. So all these technologies are truly indigenous ones. For Atman, India has achieved Atman Nirbhata in all these technologies. So except for electronics, subassemblies and components. But now what approach government and ISRO has taken is that we will concentrate more on the design aspect. So we do indigenously design and for foundry or the fabrication we are dependent on mostly in fact all over the world only two or three countries are there who have this almost a monopoly on these foundry technologies especially countries like Taiwan or Malaysia. So except for this particular aspect but government has also thought in this direction and uh, in fact there are talks going on to have at least two foundry setups in our country which will take care of this uh, electronics component fabrication aspect as well. Otherwise on all other aspects India or ISRO has achieved self-reliance or admin. This was a Niti Aayog initiative. Actually what happened was this is the general tendency in our country. There are various pockets of excellence all across the country but no they don't talk with each other. That is the major lament of uh, our people. So that connectivity which is to be provided. So Niti I took this initiative and various government departments which are engaged in the energy sector, say uh, organization like coal industry. So our coal, Ministry of Coal, similarly Ministry of Atomic Energy, Department of Atomic Energy, which is concentrated more with nuclear power. Similarly, coal is with uh, thermal power. Same way, ONGC. So all these uh, organizations have their own energy sector requirements. Or they are helping in some way or the other to the energy growth of our country. So Nitya took the initiative and ISRO gave the technology so that what we did was that our energy resources which are spread across all these uh, industries or departments who are managing each of the natural resources, whether it is nuclear power or coal, thermal power or wind power, so all uh, non-renewable uh, or renewable energy sources department. So all they were uh, brought together. We collected data based from all these institutions and put it at a one particular portal site and gave energy map for the whole country. So, and there are special rights were created for each of these uh, stakeholders. It is the government department or the user or the decision maker or the policy planner or the IAB itself or the Prime Minister's office. And uh, Honorable Prime Minister, he took a lot of interest into that and he directed uh, Deputy Chairman of Niti IO to personally take interest in this particular program and that way this whole ener geospatial energy map of the country has come up and now all the resources are available at one particular portal site and all the stakeholders have access to that. So it will bring a lot of synergy in the working of not only private sector but all the public sector as well as government departments. Will be uh, about uh, scope of space engineering India and uh, uh, message for students be it about innovation with uh, space uh, with uh, in India like innovation in India with uh, keeping space engineering in mind and also related to defense and, and innovation in general. Yeah, to add to what uh, Sastra Buddha sir told uh, regarding startups, I would like to add something on that with respect to space engineering or space sector. So as I mentioned in my lecture also, Government of India has now decided to open up space sector. And the first step in this direction is going to be uh, taken in due course within next one month itself. So with the inauguration of this in space, uh, Dr. Pawan Goenka is chairing that particular uh, Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center. So it will, it will be like a parallel agency which will work along with space commission so there will be a in space commission which will uh, give first as uh, the first step they are going to encourage all the startups and the startups include startups from students as well or engineering students or some of the entrepreneurs who have taken up this initiative in space sector so that is one aspect so all the proposal can be put up to in space commission what they will do is that they will open up the ISRO's infrastructure facilities 
which students can utilize, academics can utilize, or industry can utilize. So all three stakeholders can approach in space. In space, in turn, will facilitate the usage of ISRO facilities. So they will come back to ISRO through in space. So all of you have to approach in space, and in space, in turn, will talk with ISRO and work out the methodology and facilitate the usage of all our infrastructure, whether it is physical infrastructure or intellectual infrastructure. That means you can get consultancy from our scientists, you can utilize all our resources, whether it is computing resource or any other technology which is available in this. So that is one aspect. Now coming to the education part of that, so we have some institutes or IITs or some of the advanced uh, education universities who have courses in aerospace engineering or avionics or associated uh, fields. But, uh, and uh, ISRO itself is uh, sponsoring one of the what we call uh, organization or institute called IIST, Indian Institute of Space Technology, Space Engineering and Technology. So this IIST is located in Trivandrum. So uh, admission is through again advanced GE itself. And, uh, but the seats are limited. Earlier we used to have 100 percent intake from that organization, from that college. But now we have stopped that. So we have put a cutoff above this to get marks above some 7.4 or 7.5 then CGPA. Then only you are eligible for direct uh, entry into ISRO as a, or as a job prospect. But otherwise, many other companies are also showing interest in taking up these uh, graduates or postgraduates or doctorates from the industry. But uh, on the whole, space, aerospace or avionics as a uh, engineering degree has limited scope because that many industries are not there. ISRO is one of the employers. Similarly, there are some pros prospective requirements in organization like DRDO or atomic energy. But as such, it, uh, like other uh, common disciplines like electronics engineering or mechanical engineering, it is still early stage to go for such specialized courses in aerospace or engineering. So my advice would be to be more a generalist rather than being a specialist. But of course, it has a lot of scope outside our country, but that is not going to help our country. That so sense, it will not work out. Sir, uh, any next project of ISRO you would like to know? ISRO, of course, as I said, uh, the projects which create mass publicity are the projects mostly interplanetary mission like Chandrayaan or Mangalyaan or going to Venus. And of course, now we have taken up uh, putting human in space, Gaganyaan. But uh, these are more for achieving the technology. And as I said, it may be appearing that we are negating the Dr. Sarabhai's legacy, where he said that we should apply technology for man and society. But this is also necessary in view of the strategic requirements of the country, as all of you have seen with the Ukraine, Russia war and this Cold War and other strategies. So acquiring technology, because nobody gives you technology on a platter. Even if they give it, there will be strings attached to that. So considering all that aspects, when India aspires to be a superpower or a global power, if not a global power, at least a regional power, it is very much necessary that we, we become self-reliant in these advanced technologies also, which will take us to moon or Mars, or we, we can put our men in space and finally land. And when space colonies, space tourism, and all these things we are talking about, acquiring technology is important. But at the same time, we should not lose sight of using space research and technology for benefits of the common man or the poor people. So finally, using remote sensing for agriculture, flood mapping, disaster monitoring, all these things is also very critical for the country. Similarly, communication technologies for providing communication in rural areas or remote areas, because you would have seen northeast or, or deep uh, northern parts, they are still not connected well. And, uh, Apart from that, what uh, Dr. Sathrugudde faced the problem today when he was coming to Baroda in the morning, that his plane could not land in Delhi. So for that we have technologies called Gagan that is not going to be mandatory so that in adverse weather conditions or such uh, rainy conditions also, the 
plane will be able to assist the pilot in landing or take off. So that is going to be the technology which is basically a navigation aid to the pilots. So these are all the technologies which India is developing, ISRO is developing in collaboration with all other partners. And similarly, NAVIC is going to be our own Indian or Desi GPS. Which with the government plans that wherever we can replace GPS, we'll replace it with our NAVIC. And if we cannot replace it in some of the applications, at least augment that with our own setup of NAN. So these are few societal applications. And these are the major part of ISRO's activities or work. Um, and maybe there are not many much literature available to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to put it in a uh, applied neuroscience perspective, how to interact with our surrounding and the people around us, how to deal with the people, and how to like ourselves first, know ourselves first, and then to effectively interact with all the other people around us, working with us, our associates then we got to be cognizant about how the brain works. Because to love, to connect, and to inspire with the other people, and to have the sustainable goals, and how you're going to implement and materialize in them, depends on how efficiently your brain puts together decision-making, reasoning, planning, executive functions, memory, speech, language, and attention. So. Uh, just putting this into the perspective, what a leader needs, what a business person requires as some of the imperatives, a fundamental requirement skill set for um, uh, organizing the, the, the work atmosphere is to be well aware of how his and others' brain function in different contexts and how we're going to uh, behave in an adaptive manner. So based on that, we not only use the science and the insights about how the brain works, but we also apply sort of uh, neuroadaptive technologies. And the neuroadaptive technologies are supposed to empower and sort of modulate my brain networks to make me a brain-friendly or, or to turn me into a brain-friendly leader. So I, I get tested by uh, the people who are entrepreneurs and they are uh, well, I mean, uh, 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 aware of the, of the brain potentials and functionality that a leader would need. So they take all those uh, stuff, software, hardware, everything, and they get my brain tested as a leader. Then they use technologies to empower my, my, my mental capacity, my functionality, and my performance, cognitive fitness. And one of them is social you know, uh, cognition. So if I, as a leader, would empower my, my social cognition, then that, that'll, I'll be able to more uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, 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 manage my own decision-making and behavior and how to interact, how to, how to socialize with the other people that we are uh, working with me. So uh, some of the technologies are brain mapping, electron, electro, uh, electric brain mapping, or uh, we have other types of brain mapping, including uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. We have PET. We have also FNIRS, which is near infrared spectroscopy of the brain. So when someone wants to get the gist of neuroscience to empower his or her skill as a leader, he or she will come to the neuroleadership laboratory. So we get the person hooked up with all those uh, you know, top-notch technologies, and then we get like an outlook of how this person is going to optimize and empower and maximize his potential as a leader. Then we are using applied neurotechnology, not only for the detection of the signals, but to interfere with how the brain functions, but to empower, but to maximize how the brain functions. So those are harmless, those are non-painful, those are minimally or non-invasive, uh, you know, as I say. And they, we, we put all those things we use the virtual reality, we hook up the person with all those technologies, we use the virtual reality, so the person will be in a meeting, interacting with the other people, decide, take risks, and also, you know, does the judgment and reasoning and manages thoughts and everything. So by time, the person will, will uh, capitalize on the mental function that he already had, but he was not necessarily aware of that. 
All right, so we are going to explore those capacities in a leader as the brain is the main governor for those capacities, right? So we're nothing but our brains. So when you know how to foster the capacity and to uh, deploy those sort of capacities in the brain of a leader or an executive person, then by that you're going to help, help him or her to explore new frontiers. And that's about neural leadership in, uh, in a very short you know, and concise way. Same uh, technology for mental health issues? Yeah, yeah, apparently what, what is for certain is that neuroscience is, neuroscience is going to take over as one of, the, one of the four pillars of the future science perspectives and science domains. But we have nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and ultimately cognitive science, which stems in, in neuroscience. So we, when, we, when we discuss neuroscience potentials with decision makers and policy makers, uh, this is about a concept of a cell, a neuron in the brain, all the way up to the society. So how you are going to utilize and how you are going to bank on neuroscience insight to serve the society. Because if we want to have a better society, we need to have better people. If we want to have a better people, if we want to have better people, you need to have better brains. So how to get better brains is that to know the brain first and to get the fingerprint, how the brain, a brain of that a specific person functions and how to take that to next level. And that's why neuroscience has many things to do with different aspects of our life, not only leadership, but all different kind of things. And what we, what we put it into a con concept as neuroscience of everything, or NOE. And this applies to different lines of our life. So different lines of our activity, including your, your, your personal life, your physical life, your mental health, as you said, your physical health, and also your social health, your spiritual health, and also your economic health. And that finds a way into different realms of the societal life, which includes neuroscience and its interface with a sport for the athletes. We call it neurosport. Neuroscience, when it comes together with uh, economy, it is called neuroeconomy. And likewise, we have neuromarketing. We have neuroeducation, imagine. And then we also have neuro, uh, like uh, a defense. We also use that in the defense forces. Also, we have uh, the application of neural science into, uh, like, uh, uh, as as I said, uh, into into different things, including art. So let's think about neural art. And if you are just kind of thinking about the merger of neural adaptive technologies and different domains of our functionality at societal level, this that makes sense, right? So you you think of potentiating the brain capacities or potentiating the brain functions to serve better at a distinct job position. So even for the HR, if someone wants to get you know, a place and receives a placement in a company, his brain is an accountant brain. His brain is a CEO brain. His brain is like a decision-making brain. His brain is a learning brain. So by that, you're going to put the people in the best given job position. So there are lots of different things to discuss about how neuroscience, how discussing, how understanding, how exploring uh, brain function from the neuron level, from the cellular, cellular molecular level up to the neural circuit level, to neural network level, to neural system level, and the brain functional level. And it is not only the brain, of course. We, we, we have brain and body interface. We have brain and environment interface. We have the body and environment interface. So we're talking about this triangle, brain, body, and environment. So when you are just you know, uh, uh, optimizing this interaction between the, the main three different pillars of our life, which is brain, body, and environment, then you can uh, expect productivity. You can expect the impact and the real influence of brain science and related technologies. Because today, we are at the faculty of uh, engineering and computer science and technology, right? So we need to find even a more clearer way to cross-connect technology and, uh, and you know, engineering, computer science, IT, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and all the related technologies, all the way back to brain science. And from brain science all the way forward to how to utilize brain science to, to make uh, uh, applied technology 
even more implementable. My, my advice to my friends and those who are uh, pursuing a career into brain science is that, well, if they find a way to study neuroscience, they definitely got to be excited because they have been stepping into a miraculous world of brain studies, number one. Number two is that they should not necessarily worry about grades or, I don't know, pass scores or diplomas or postgraduate certificates. They should be thinking about how to serve the cause, how they are going to utilize their learned motives to help the people, their people, their country, and the people in the region, and every and all people on the planet. Okay, How we are utilizing our education to make a world a better place to be. And then uh, my other advice to them is that to, uh, to be patient. Sometimes it's discouraging, it's hard, it's, it's, it's not tantalizing enough because when you go to the library you see tons and tons of different references and you haven't uh, read about all those books and then it makes you panicky. So uh, apart from that, be optimist uh, be hardworking, forward-looking, and be uh, aspirant to what you are really pursuing as a student, as a scholar. And by that, uh, uh, you will find a way. And by time, you're going to be focused. You do the follow-up, and you certainly need to be need to be disciplined. So, and last but not least, is that I got to get connected with the people as a scholar, as a student. So I got to see places attend conferences, write papers, read books, contact people, use social media to, to just connect the dots, find people who are going to inspire me, who are going to help me find a way. Because the people cannot uh, walk the way on my behalf. They can just show me the way, right? So I will find the people to show me the best way to take. So I travel, I see the world, but I should remember where my roots are. And then remember about the roots, get back to home whenever you can, or wherever you are in the world, let's help our people, the, the ethnic group that we belong to. So our people, our surrounding, our land, our world, our planet, and our brain, right? That's it. One of the committee was none other than GTO Vice Chancellor Akshay Agarwalji. And thereafter, we lost that policy that our students need to be encouraged to create startups. So there are two, three things which we started. One is the Smart India Hackathon, under which a lot of challenging problems which students are solving. If there is a possibility that it can be converted into a startup, we, we promote it. All undergraduate and diploma students have to do an undergraduate project in their uh, final year. Diploma also in the third year and engineering college students in the fourth year. Many of these students have some new idea which they want to implement and sometimes it has potential to become a startup. So we identify and we have a award function for best project of the college students called Chhatra Vishwakarma Award and we select such students who have shown the potential and if they are interested in carrying forward up to a amount of rupees 10 lakh we give support from AICT itself. Government of India also has its policy of uh, providing support for the startups and many times we don't get funding for proof of concept. Once it is proved then many angel investors will come forward, invest their money and then it takes off. But it is the beginning where uh, there are challenges actually because their families may also not support. They will say, ye kya kar rahe ho? So therefore, some institutions, maybe semi-government, government, if they have created a fund from out of that, the initial support, it may be only 4, 5 lakh, 6 lakh, up to maximum 10 lakh. The technology capability of that startup will be proved in that process and then many others will give their encouragement and then funding and it can become big. Sir, uh, quality of education is different in different states. So 
So how will NEP help maintain the uniformity of uh, the education equality? NDP is not meant for uh, uniform education, but however, we don't want that the quality of education should be poor in any state for that matter, any state or union territory. Therefore, on our part, we provide model curriculum. When we say model, it is only uh, the you know the one which we can adopt, adapt, make changes depending on local, regional requirements, and then proceed. Why do we do that is some of these courses which are relevant today for industry, for society, for innovation, if they are not part of the curriculum, our students will find it that they will not get employed, they will not be competing in the world outside and therefore some minimum thing has to be provided. Over and above that, it is up to the individual university which is autonomous to decide on what type of additional courses are to be imparted. Maybe sometimes it is very relevant to the local needs, maybe in terms of textile, maybe in terms of there is an auto industry, so they want to gear up their children for uh, the auto industry or for a steel industry. But overall curriculum must contain all those foundational principles, applications of engineering to different domains of knowledge. That is what is created and to that extent there is uniformity, but otherwise one cap fits for all does not suit any any country of that world for any region of that world and therefore each university has its own role to look into the model curriculum make changes as desired and then go ahead sir is there any plan to set up a center for aict in gujarat right now we had a plan of setting up a, a training center in baroda baroda itself the land was promised, it has still not come. Uh, once the land is given, probably a training academy for faculty members. But what we have observed is uh, curriculum changes, but the faculty are the same old stuff who teach the same thing uh, what they learnt uh, 25 years ago. And therefore, constant training of faculty, not theoretical but also practical, you know, is being forwarded. Uh, you rightly pointed out, uh, our uh, chairman also pointed out, see for medical profession after they graduate, mandatory internship is there. We have also introduced mandatory internship for all students of engineering. Unless you go through six months of internship, you are not complete. You know theory but you don't know where it is applied, how it is applied, why it is applied and therefore you must visit industry, learn those hands-on practice and then you can become a successful father. But when we say about uh, students, why not about teachers? And teachers also, not only when they get into the profession, they must go to the industry for internship, but for their every promotion, we have made some modules mandatory, including internship. Because industry has changed in the last uh, seven years, 10 years. So you, you can't remain where you were and you have to catch up with what is happening in the industry. So for promotion from assistant to associate, associate to professor, both in industry and some of these labs <coughs> like idea labs, 3D printing labs, you, you have uh, different types of uh, robots which are there or, or uh, the variety of uh, AI and machine learning tools, if they are available in one location, teachers uh, continuously around the year can come for one week, 10 days and then get trained and then go back. So that kind of an Atal Academy we wanted to establish, it's still on the cards. Intrapreneur Award and also Jeevan Gaurav Puraskar, so can you, like we are just curious to know about uh, the award. Nene, Jeevan Puraskar is the Lifelong Achievement Award, it's uh, as you get older, whatever little achievement you have made, people recognize that, <laughs> that is not a big deal about it. But uh, this intrapreneur is a terminology used by this Praj Industries for quite some time for a different uh, set of, we know yeah, entrepreneurs are the ones who develop business, who develop uh, idea into a product or process and then uh, create their own business. But there are people in every organization who have the same abilities, that of an entrepreneurship, but they are not doing it for themselves, but they work for the company or they work for an organization. So maybe a college principal or a vice chancellor has entrepreneurial capabilities, 
but he is not creating an entrepreneurship for profit making but he will transform the educational institution in a manner that uh, it has all the elements of entrepreneurship and th these people are called intrapreneurs they are within the organization they are not the owners of the company but they are employees maybe someone is a managing director someone may be a general manager someone may be a principal of a uh, college or a vice chancellor of a university or in isro many scientists are having the same spirit of entrepreneurship but they contribute for the well being of the organization and in turn to the society they are called intrapreneurs and that recognition was given for the transformation that happened in college of engineering in pune